You tell us the truth, and I can guarantee you will I feel better. I tell you. You didn't tell us the truth. Somebody hurt that baby. The baby didn't suffocate on the, on the, on the mattress. The only two people in that room, according to you and your mother, were you and Edwin. If you didn't do it, Edwin did it. This is the interrogation of Na Truong. Sorry if I butchered that name. She is accused of having killed her child back in December 2008. Around that time, she called 911, advising that her child is no longer breathing. Unfortunately, an hour or two later in hospital, her child died. She was a teenager when this happened, but she was tried as an adult. She wasn't allowed to attend the funeral of her son, and she was on suicide watch while she was in solitary confinement for four months. Two years into her sentence, a lawyer was not convinced by this confession tape you're about to watch. He gave it to a judge by the name of Janet Kenton Walker, who was interested in suppressing the confession. Now at center stage was this police videotape and the problems that come with it. I'll be analyzing her behavior and the behavior of the police throughout this video. If you do end up liking, please subscribe. I'm nearly at a thousand subscribers. Who's here? Who? Who's here? Trump. Who? H E I N Trump. Bro Your brother? How did he pass away? Sudden death syndrome. There's no sudden death syndrome. Sudden death syndrome? How about big sister syndrome? You were watching him when he died, right? Is that not true? No. Okay. And now you're alone with another baby and he dies? Are we going to keep doing this? Okay, profiling. That's what he's doing. He's having a look at her history and he's saying, hey, you've done this before. This is indicative of your behavior. Her brother died previously while she was watching him or something to that effect. And now she's done it again. I do understand why police and lawyers and, you know, in the courtroom, you know, they go through like a, like a behavioral analysis, not necessarily the psychology, but they go through their social behavior. They go through what kind of friends they have. They break down one's personality. But I think in this case, it's unfair. Look at her. She's not upset because she's been interrogated. She's not upset because she's been intimidated. She still is in shock that her child has died. Are you going to tell me what happened? <laughs> you told me what happened? His face was in the mattress. Oh, we're done here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're going to go now. Cut the shit! I'm not lying. Then Edwin did it. One of you did it. Because that medical examiner told me that that baby was smothered. Does that change your story? Are you going to argue with what the, a scientist has to say about how your baby died? Okay. Your story is going to be that he was sleeping with his face down on the mattress and that's all you know? We'll go with that. I'll go to court with that. I really don't care. But if you want us to hear your side of the story, you better damn well do it now. Now previously when I mentioned that she, her brother died while in his, her care, she was eight years old. Now the officer would know this, but he uses it against her just for the purposes of having an upper hand or for intimidation. However, in the officer's favor, if he has just seen that a doctor or a coroner or whoever has told him this baby was killed by somebody, that supposedly. I can understand his disgusted look at her and paying her no respect, if you see what I'm saying, right? Care, in your care, that baby mysteriously dies. And now Kyle's in your care and he mysteriously dies. 
you're a liar. You got, just got the worst luck in the world. How do you think a jury's going to see that? Now you said earlier, you're going to tell me the truth. I'm I waiting. Did. No, you didn't. I'm sorry? We'll never kill her. Really? Never do that. Well, two babies have died in your care. It's kind of hard to believe at this point. Throughout this whole interrogation, she has remained the same. She hasn't pleaded for forgiveness. She hasn't continuously rambled on. You know how some suspects continually talk, looking for validation from the police officer to make themselves feel better about the situation you're in. I think everything she has done, the way she's acted, is perfectly reasonable and normal in this circumstance. However, I also don't think the officer has done anything too drastic so far. He's raised his tone a little bit. You guys might disagree. That's fair. That's not a problem. I think that the officer could have been a lot worse. Based on all the evidence, there's no doubt what happened in there. All everyone's waiting for today is for you to admit to what you did so that we can start the process of getting you some help, getting you into a social program, and getting your brothers out of that house and get them in a better home where there's a mom that gets up in the morning and takes care of them. Is it okay to talk about this next time? There's no next time. Why do you want to talk about it next time? Because I'm telling you guys. So what's going to change for next time? No, it goes like this. You tell us what happened. We walk right out here to special crimes, juvenile, get on the phone, talk to a social worker, and try to get you some help. Or you walk out of there, I call the medical examiner, get his full report, get his findings, which indicate that Kyle was strangled and on his back when it happened, and I put my case together. One of those things is going to happen today. When you say next time, is there something you feel you have to take care of before you admit to this, or what? I just want to get Kyle feeling mm -hmm. That's understandable. Because the officers now want to get the ball rolling, they start giving her options. If you tell the truth, we can get you help. Right? Try and calm her down, give her a sense of security so she thinks okay maybe i should tell the truth if indeed she committed the crime but if you look at her hands the whole time she's probably playing with that tissue right that she had to wipe her face earlier she's looking down to her right and she's staring on the ground i genuinely believe she's thinking about her child the whole time she's probably going through memories of her brother when she was young over and over in her head and she's probably thinking that she's still in shock and disbelief. Everything she is displaying right now for me, using my intellect, analyzing her, is the definition of a distraught mother. She could wail. She could be screaming at the top of her lungs. This is the shock. This is the depression. This is the disbelief of an event so cataclysmic she doesn't even know how to respond. Imagine being in that situation and then at the same time having to explain to two men who are trying to put you in jail and keep a cool head at the same time. Once you do it, you'll be on the right path. Then maybe, just maybe, something good will come out of all this. We have to know what exactly happened. Nah, and then try to figure out why it happened. And then that's how the, the courts decide on what treatment, how to proceed with the treatment, and what exactly should happen. Okay? That's how it works. Keep it in the juvenile court, keep the juvenile system, so the punishment is minimal, if any. I'm not saying there is any, 
where they're more attuned to getting people's help because they're still juveniles. You've been through the system, you understand. Can I just admit it that I do that? You don't have to go into great detail, but what did you do? Okay, so what I meant by bargaining is that now they are giving her uh, an olive branch, right? They are saying, if you confess, we can, hey, we can do this for you. If you confess, hey, this is how we can get you help and, you know, we can make the situation better. Which is why now, when she has said, I can admit that I did it or something to that effect. In his head, he's so relieved, he's thinking, okay, don't tell me everything, just tell me a little bit. Again, he's trying to keep her at ease. <sighs> now, can I ask you one more question? Do you know why you would do that? To conclude, in this confession, the officer on the right was using the maximizing technique where he's going to be aggressive and essentially he's going to say, a confession is your best way out. If that's not working or if they need to change the, the tone, then the officer on the left will use what's known as minimization or minimizing, where trying to give the suspect a bit more hope, more of a pragmatic approach to it. Now, after she was sentenced, as I mentioned previously, in 2011, she was released for the following reasons. A judge found that one, this confession was inadmissible because she was not given her special Miranda rights as she's a juvenile. Number two, I mentioned the two techniques, uh, maximization and minimization. It was found the police abused this privilege or technique, whatever you want to call it, by the use of false statements, deception, trickery, and implied promises. And there was also a lack of physical evidence which raised the question of why these two detectives presumed her to be guilty in the first place. So why don't you comment, tell me your thoughts on her behaviour, their behaviour and was it the right decision?